All right, welcome everyone. Uh, I'd like to just go through a couple of housekeeping items before I turn over the mic here. Uh, first off, just to let you know at 6.30 today that the Pony Awards are going to be held. Uh, you are in Mandalay, Man <clears throat> let's try that again, Mandalay Bay GH. If you're not meaning to be in this room, please stick around. This is going to be a very good talk. This is, and I apologize, Commercial Mobile Spyware Detecting the Undetectable with Joshua Dahlman and Valerie Hanke. Without further ado. Thank you. Right. Can everybody hear me? Yes. All right. Perfect. Thank you all for being here. Um, so again, today we're going to talk about commercial mobile spyware detecting the undetectable. So about the authors. My name is Joshua Dolman, second generation digital forensics examiner. My father helped start the Michigan State Police Computer Crimes Lab in the late 1990s. So I grew up around digital forensics. I grew up around NCASE, FTK, the old mayor's wear tools. I have a master's degree in digital forensics from the University of Central Florida. I have numerous certifications, and I'm currently working on a PhD in information assurance from Nova Southeastern University. My co-presenter and co-worker, Valerie Hanke, has a master's degree in cybersecurity from the University of Maryland, University College, and is also a graduate of the U.S. Naval Academy in Annapolis. Um, she also has many certifications. So why are we here today? Today we are going to talk about mobile spyware. We're for, first going to introduce what mobile spyware is. We're going to talk about research methods and then the results and then have a conclusion and take questions. So commercial mobile spyware you can find it online through Google search. Very easy to obtain. Quick Google search for Android Spyware yields dozens of hits. Um, easy to install. Lots of features uh, such as capturing text messages, pictures, locations, all sorts of stuff. And it stores that data on a third party remote server. So if you purchase Spyware, from, let's say, mSpy, for example. And you install it on a phone, the data on that phone that mSpy collects is stored on the mSpy servers. And depending, it may already be on your enterprise network. So there's some variation amongst the spyware programs and what they collect. At minimum, they will collect text messages, call history, web history, Wi-Fi networks, emails, GPS locations. Others, you can activate the microphone on the device and listen in on conversations ongoing in the room without the phone owner's knowledge. You can activate the camera. You can even eavesdrop on conversations while they're happening, depending on the program. So what we know about these, but what do we know about these types of programs? Well, there hasn't been a lot of research out there, but what has been done, Checkpoint Lacoon did a study earlier this year they found over 20 different variants against a very fragmented market and 18 families. Um, of note, they found two programs, mSpy and Spy2Mobile, accounted for over half of all infections. And those are the two we're going to talk about today. Uh, we looked at more than just those two, but we're focusing on those two to give you the most value for being here. If you have over 2,000 devices on your network, um, on your enterprise network, you have a 50% chance of having at least one of those devices. Uh, being infected. So are these devices legal? And the answer to that is, well, it kind of depends. Um, last year, last October, the FBI out of the Virginia office arrested the owner of a similar, uh, one of these spyware companies called Stealth Genie. He later pled guilty and paid a $500,000 fine. That company was shut down. That was kind of a watershed moment when it comes to these mobile spyware programs. In the past, prior to this, they had been marketed towards cheating spouses. In fact, one of them, when I was researching, even had a Valentine's Day special. You could buy the spyware 20% off on Valentine's Day. How about that? Um, they're now marketed towards employees and child monitoring. Again, kind of changing course uh, when it comes to legal. They have a legal disclaimer. And most of the companies are still up and running. Yes, the FBI arrested the owner of Stealth Genie but the two largest are still up and running, being mSpy and Spy2Mobile. 
So why should you care about this? Why are we here? You know, if you're doing cybersecurity for an enterprise, you know, why do you care if someone's spouse put spyware on their phone? How would that affect your organization? Well, we mentioned that these, these spyware companies store the data on a third-party server. So what could go wrong with that? Well, earlier this year, MSPY being the largest, according to the Lacoon Checkpoint study, was breached. Their server was breached. And what was interesting about this is when I first looked at them back in October of last year, they were using Amazon Web Service, AWS out of Virginia. FBI then arrested Stealth Genie, the owner, and they since moved to Germany. Um, and you can see how that worked out. They moved to some third-party server and some new server, and they were breached. Hundreds of gigabytes of data was posted. So, for example, corporate emails, uh, wireless network information, perhaps wireless passwords, text messages, pictures, emails, all available now to download from anybody who wants to. So here, here's what we did. We took a Samsung Galaxy S3, um, kit running KitKat. We captured both volatile analysis, or volatile memory, so we used Android Debug Bridge, which is a free Google tool. We connected it to the phone and created a shell window on it. We then pushed MEM and Netcat, two free open source tools. You can download them from GitHub. Um, MEM being supported by Donnie Tyndall, who is a brilliant instructor. So we pushed those to memory. So we ran cat proc mounts, and we saw that tempfs, which is an Android memory, is mounted to slash dev in this case. So we just copied them slash dev. We're both forensics people. We want to minimize the footprint that our tools have on the device, on the phone. Um, so once we captured that memory from the running process, um, the spyware, we ran strings on it and saw what we could find. We also used a Celebrate, um, Celebrate 4PC and Physical Analyzer to do physical acquisition analysis to see what we could find from the so-called undetectable spyware programs. So about mSpy. Again, being the most popular spyware program, sold on a subscription basis, relatively inexpensive to buy. Um, they also claim to have over a million customers. So installing mSpy, you need physical access to the phone. For Android, you have to modify the security settings to allow trusted apps, browse to the website, download and install the APK. When you purchase the Spyware program, you have to enter a username and password and create an account. They will email you a special code, like an author, authorization code. Uh, when you install the Spyware, you type it in and you're in. If that is too hard for you, if you need additional assistance, don't worry, there is tech support available. So while you're owning a phone, if you have trouble, you can go and for an extra fee, their tech support people will call you and talk you through it, which is handy, I guess. So once it's on the phone, they have a command and control server. Um, just a dashboard. This would be where the adversary monitors the intrusion. It's the C2. Uh, so you can look at call logs. You can look at text messages, um, data fencing. You can look at Skype, WhatsApp, and all sorts of, inf of information on here. You can also set up settings where you tell the device, OK, when you're hooked up to Wi-Fi, I only want you to transmit the pictures back to the C2 or the server at that point, or you can select cellular. So you can monitor and control the intrusion from here. So what did we find with mSpy? Well, when we pulled the memory and ran strings on it, we found the settings from the previous slide stored locally on the phone. OK, that's kind of cool. So the SMS, you know, that is turned on, that is enabled. So you, you see enabled true. Wi-Fi only fault is set to false. We found more, though. I'm sorry. Not too fast. It also, also captured the location of the device. So as it's running, you can see the latitude and longitude being captured. And you can also see the domains. Um, notice, for example, you have THD.CC as one of the domains it's using. We took a packet capture. We used a free open source tool called Shark for Root and took a packet capture. So we install it, started the packet capture, sent a text message. The Spower program kicked off and started sending that data back to the server. And again, if you look very closely, I know it's kind of small. Do you see a, a familiar domain on there? 
the thd.cc. And we did a whois domain tools search, and we found out that the IP address, we looked it up, is 136.243.253.185. Again, a German IP address now. Um, previously, that was using Amazon Web Service out of Ashburn, Virginia. Okay, so what did we find using the Celebrate tool? Well, we found additional evidence um, that the spyware program left behind. We found evidence in the web history where the attacker had to pick up the phone and browse to a website to download the APK file. Um, we found that the process, or the ins installation process, installed a root data Android sys process. If anybody in here is doing digital forensics or computer forensics, and you have a Cellbrite image and you're looking for spyware, a great place to start is to look at the installed applications and scroll through those and look at the permissions. Um, spyware, by its nature, is going to be very invasive. Um, typically, you'll see it has permissions to pretty much everything on the phone. It definitely stands out. Um, in addition, we had an applications folder containing a SQLite database. It contained a log of all the data sent back to the C2. So here's actually the internal of that DB. This was stored locally on the phone. So you could see the text messages, URLs that were visited. Um, you could see the locations and all sorts of information here stored locally on the phone. So I'm gonna bring up my coworker, Valerie, and she's gonna cover Spy2 Mobile. Good evening, thank you again for coming. Uh, my name is Valerie Hankey, and I'll be talking about Spy2 Mobile, which is the second most common mobile spyware application. Uh, it is sold on a subscription basis for 99 cents a day. And in order to get a clean image on our phone, um, after we used mSpy, we blew out a new ROM on the phone using Odin, and then um, updated the phone to the latest version of Android, uh, KitKat 4.4.4, and rooted the device. This was to ensure that we didn't have any traces of mSpy left on the phone. So just like with mSpy, installing uh, Spy2 Mobile requires physical access to the phone. The attacker has to go in and modify the security settings to allow untrusted applications. From there, they can open up a browser such as Google Chrome and go to the spy2mobile.com website. From there, they can go and download and install uh, its data underscore backup .apk. And once this is installed, Data Backup puts a, a widget onto the phone, onto the screen, and it, it cannot be deleted. We tried several different ways to remove it, and the only way we found out you could remove it is by just completely wiping the phone and putting a new image on it. Um, and so this looks just like the settings widget, uh, like a little settings cog, and so to the average user, they're probably not gonna notice a widget like this on their phone, especially if it cannot be deleted. Uh, from there, they, the attacker enters their email address in order to register with Spy2 Mobile. So this is the command and control uh, for Spy2 Mobile. It's very similar to mSpy. Uh, in the upper left, you can see that we are currently monitoring a Samsung GT i9300, which is our Samsung Galaxy S3. And we can see the phone's IMEI, the, that the phone is connected. And so if the phone were to be turned off or put into airplane mode, it would show that the phone is disconnected. Uh, the attacker is able to track via GPS. Uh, you can see here um, in the middle, it shows the Latin long and a date time stamp of where the phone is currently located. Uh, can also monitor the battery level and um, the versions of software. On the right hand side, we're able to see uh, the user's contacts. You can see there's one contact in the phone and a phone number. Uh, the different text messages, uh, call history, and different chat applications such as WhatsApp and Viber. Uh, Spy2 Mobile is not as robust as mSpy is. Uh, doesn't track as many features, but it's still cost effective uh, for an attacker. So we did the uh, same kind of forensic analysis for Spy2 Mobile that we did for mSpy. We looked at the memory, uh, application memory, and we were able to, we sent a text message to a phone number and we were, Spy2Mobile was able to capture 
the text message, the call, or the SMS time, and you can see that SMS was sent on July 7th, 2015 at 18.28.07 GMT. Uh, Spy2 Mobile captures the time in Unix time, and which isn't really user friendly. So if you throw it into a time conversion, you can get a time that makes sense to people. And you can see the content of the text message is I love Black Cat 2015, and it was sent to phone number 5552368. And there are extra cool points if anyone knows who that phone number belongs to. So we looked at the application memory, and we're able to see all the recorded wireless networks. And Spy2 Mobile doesn't just collect the wireless networks that the phone connects to. It also collects any wireless network that is available at that moment in that area. So we had two different networks available in our office. We had a guest network and our pen testing lab network. And it shows both of those with their latitude and longitude. And then it shows the Wi-Fi's that are stored. So we actually connected the phone to our guest network in Columbia. And it sh stores that, and it stores the latitude and longitude of where we were. So using Shark for Root, we did take a PCAP, and we're able to analyze the network traffic for SPY2 Mobile. Uh, and it shows that it communicates with IP address 107.20.217.40 using TCP over port 7766. So we threw this into a Whois lookup to figure out uh, where this IP address was. And it is registered to Wild West Domains LLC and is um, hosted by Amazon AWS in Ashburn, Virginia. So we took a physical uh, rip of the phone using Celebrite's UFED for PC and then analyzed the, the rip using Celebrite's physical analyzer. And we can see the Google Chrome history where the attacker went to Spy2 Mobile's website and downloaded the, the data underscore backup.apk file. And we can see where Spy2 Mobile um, is installed in the root directory. And if you drill down into Spy2 Mobile's folder structure, there is a SQLite database called system.db. And that is where all the data is stored collected by Spy2 Mobile. So here's a screen cap of the systems.db, and it shows what the attacker has access to, uh, the metadata, the call logs, contacts, uh, messages, and all the different Wi-Fi networks the phone had access to. So you can see that just, we just drove around, and we touched 65 different wireless networks. Didn't connect to any of them, but Spy2 Mobile will just capture that. And it's a good way for an attacker to know where their victim is. So how do you know if you've been infected? Um, you know, to the average user, they're probably not going to know that they have spyware on their phone. <clears throat> so the best bet is to always use a strong passcode and limit the physical access to your phone. Um, don't leave the phone on your desk and step away for a meeting or something. Um, always check you know, URLs visited, anything that's been downloaded on the phone, just to ensure that something isn't something you did. Um, always look at your security settings and determine if you have enabled untrusted applications to be installed. And I know many people that have droids uh, do root their phones. Um, people who have iOS devices might jailbreak them. Um, but just know that your phone is more susceptible to spyware. Um, and always look for a new widget or something that doesn't look right on your phone. Um, I'm an iOS user, and every time you do an iOS up update and to the latest software version, Apple has some new application that you can't delete on your phone. And you know, just like with Spy2 Mobile, you might think, oh, there's just another application that you know, Android put or Samsung, whoever put on there that I can't delete. Um, and if you're ever uncertain, just you, know, you can always take a PCAP. Um, there are many free, free tools, open source tools out there. Uh, look at the data. Um, there's many free um, forensic tools out there. Um, that you can use to, to try and figure out if your phone has been infected. Uh, there is some similar work out there. We aren't the first ones to look at commercial mobile spyware. Taylor and Robinson presented at DEF CON 20 on uh, commercial mobile spyware 
uh, we chose um, different applications to look at, and uh, we chose the top two, and um, we also looked at the volatile memory. Um, again, we are with Fidelis Cybersecurity. Uh, please stop by booth 719, check us out. Um, we have fantastic products and uh, services. Uh, we have lots of talks and demos. Um, are there any questions? Not that we noticed. Oh, the question was if the, uh, the Spyro applications uh, utilize more battery consumption. And from, from our analysis, uh, we did not notice that. So on the subscription services, did you notice that the spyware was still collecting data after the, uh, you'd stop paying the 99 cents a day or whatnot? Can I answer that one? Um, we weren't able to tell for sure because once the subscription stopped, you weren't able to log in. But for example, on Spy2 Mobile, we tried and we literally couldn't uninstall it. Um, so the undetectable spyware, you tried moving the widget, you log in the website, there's no uninstallation tools for that spyware program. So presumably, but I have no way to know for sure on that. So you, you didn't check like PCAP files to see if any more data was flying out to... I can go back and look, but no, we didn't research that. We just um, collected it once we finished. And I think the phone number was from Ghostbusters. You yes. are correct, sir. <laughs> cool points for you. Hi. How did you get the memory acquisition? Okay. Um, so what we did is we used ADB, Android Debug Bridge, which allowed us to go from our laptop to the phone, we created a shell, a shell, and since the phone was rooted, we were able to have root access. So then we used ADB to push MEM and NETCAT from our laptop to the memory on the phone. And then from there, just command line. Uh, if you check our white paper on that, we literally go step by step with screenshots with command line syntax telling you how to do that. Uh, another question, did you look into the code implementation of the spyware? No, we did not. Okay. Is there any spyware that allows you to put your own backend in where you don't need their server, put it on your own web server? Not that I saw, but I'm not going to say it doesn't exist. Um, the ones we saw, the ones we tested, all use their server, but I'm not going to say there isn't something out there that's more customizable. We try to focus on the top two and things that are more common or more popular, things that unsophisticated actors might do. All right. um, I noticed the two IP addresses all relate to Amazon.com. Do you have any thoughts about that? Oh, one of them was from Germany. The other one was AWS. So that was the hosting. Service. M, M Spy was hosted by uh, Amazon AWS, but they moved to Germany. And the only reason we can think of is to avoid US jurisdiction if they're hosted by a foreign country. That's but a, can't say 100%. Yeah, that's our speculation on that. We can't talk to them, so we can just guess on that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? All right. Um, oh. Yes, sir. Are there any known mobile spyware that can be installed without physical access to the phone? Uh, that can't be what? I'm sorry, can you are, say are that there again? Any, are there any mobile spyware applications that can be installed without physical access to the phone? I think phone? there was a briefing on that earlier today on the, from Josh Drake on that. Um, but, uh, not that. Probably not commercially available, but I'm sure there are some three-letter agencies that can do that. <laughs> From an enterprise security standpoint, is it possible to build an IDS signature to detect these while they're running on the wireless network within the enterprise? Possibly. I mean, we certainly have the domains um, you could alert off of. Um, as far as that, I guess it depends on the phone, too, if you have any way to track um, processes, programs on the phone but you could certainly off of the IP addresses. Because those, those are static, those weren't changing for us.
Any other questions? Well, thank you all for attending. Hope you had a great day at Black Hat, and hope to see you all around. Thank you. Thanks.